Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. Happy Friday. Oh, the weekend is here. It's the day after my birthday. We made it through the week. I hope you're going to have an awesome weekend. I am. I'm going to be with family and friends in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm going to get you into the weekend on a great note with a fantastic show. Uh, King Randall, you guys remember King Randall from Albany, Georgia. He's going to be here. He's in a, involved in a tiny bit of controversy for saying too much of the truth, which has kind of been our topic all week, the truth and how saying the truth gets you in trouble. And so we're going to check back in with King Randall at the top of today's show. Uh, Shamika Michelle and Bryson Gray will be here as well. I want to talk about the new Tupac movie or documentary that's been playing on FX. It's two episodes in. The third episode, it's five episodes in total. The third episode will play tonight and be released on Hulu and FX. We review the first two episodes. It's a pretty interesting conversation I think we're going to have uh, because I don't like this documentary, I don't think. And then we'll end the show by talking to a pastor from Jacksonville, Florida, who I saw his TED talk on rap music and black murder. And I was like, man, I got to get Michael Smith on the show. And so we'll do that today. And that'll be your Friday. But I want to start uh, with King Randall, the young man uh, out of Albany, Georgia, that has started a, uh, a school uh, for young black men and for black kids. Uh, that is training them up and teaching them traditional values and how to go out and do for self and not filling them up with all this vi victimhood mentality. Uh, I want to show you a clip of King Randall uh, talking at uh, Booker T. Washington School, I think. Let's watch this clip. Booker T. Washington's book, Up From Slavery, we read in my book club with my boys. This man's vocabulary is, is so extensive, we have to have a dictionary to literally read his book. Imagine a former slave having a better vocabulary than you. That's a great point. And again, that's the kind of truth, little nuggets of truth that just spew out of King Randall's mouth. And King Randall's like 25 years old. He's just, he's just a young guy himself. He's doing more. Uh, for black kids in America than just about anybody, particularly all these people that are running around spewing this victimhood stuff. Uh, and then I want to play you this clip, I think, from a podcast interview that, that I think uh, Randall was in, involved in and did. Let's, let's watch this clip. When I was asking the boys, I said, man, I said, imagine a former slave having a better vocabulary than you. Mm -hmm. And they were like, whoa. And it was just like, that made me feel some type of way. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't make me feel some type of way. It makes me want to do better. Because I'm like, how can a former slave, you know, have a better vocabulary than yeah. me? He writes better than me. He, I mean, he, he grew up and didn't know how to read or write. He taught himself. So for us not to be able to know how to read and not be able to do these simple things, we have YouTube and all that. Imagine if they had a YouTube or textbooks and things like that. They'd be so much further. King Randall's perspective is irritating a lot of people and he's facing a lot of blowback. We want to show him some support and I want to talk about his little latest controversy and back and forth where he had to record another video setting the record straight on why he was being crucified as a sellout and an Uncle Tom for not telling young black people, you're a victim and you can't make it in this world. King Randall, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, walk us through what's been going on with you the last week, week and a half or so, and some of the blowback you've been getting. Sure. Uh, well, good to see you and uh, happy birthday. Um, but, you know, uh, for the most part, man, um, I made a video uh, basically explaining why I decided to start teaching boys in our community how to read better. And it was because me and our students, we read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. And this was like four years ago. I'm 23 now, by the way. Um, but I started this book club when I was 19. And I had 20 young men at my house before I had a school, before I had any offices or anything like that. We were in my, my living room, in my dining room, like teaching them how to read. And I'm asking other people, I'm like, how exactly could a slave under the threat of death, under the threat of lynching, under the threat of all this stuff, teach themselves how to read better than me and I go to sleep in a nice bed every night and I have food to eat 
and a place to sleep, you know, and, and just I don't have to worry about my granddaddy being hung in the middle of the night or having to go to a different water fountain or worry about bad schooling or bad textbooks or what have you. I have an entire way to be able to teach myself how to read. And these guys, under the threat of death, taught themselves how to read and write. It's absolute nonsense, you know, and, and people came to me and they're like, oh, you're you're just it's so much going on. It's the wealth gap happening and and black people are behind because of this and we're behind because of that. And this happened. And 60 years ago, this blew up. And then I made a video um, about something that Malcolm X said. Now, people were vil vilifying me as if I said the quote. So I had to play the video of Malcolm directly saying what he said. Then it turned into, well, you're hurting the case for reparations and things like that. And like I explained to them, I don't have a dog in the fight for reparations. If you get it, cool. If you don't, that's fine. I still have stuff to do right now. Our students still need help right now. These people are acting like, you know, if we don't fight for reparations, then we will never be successful. And I had this guy, we were in a space talking about this. And this guy's like, you know, you can help all those kids all you wanted, but we don't get reparations. They still going to go out there and die and get killed and, and all this nonsense. And I'm just like, dude, I haven't had any of my students die or get killed. I haven't had any of them go back to jail. All of them are doing fine. My, the kids that have graduated from my program are in college. They're doing their thing. Um, I even pay some of my students who've left to come back and work with us. They they work at the school. They'll help mentor some of the kids because they've been through the program. But these guys, you know, feel like he's just like, we're going to never be successful unless we get reparations. I'm just like, bro, you are you are insane. You know how many successful people it is out here who made good decisions or who work hard? It's like, well, people working hard every day. Well, it's because nobody's teaching them what to work hard on. This is what we have this particular school for. Yeah, you could be working hard flipping burgers, but if nobody actually told you money management and, and taught you what to work on and how to invest and all that stuff, then of course you might be working hard every day. You might be working harder than me, but I know what to work hard on. You know, so it's like not having that knowledge of things to do and they'll blame it on poverty and the white man and the wealth gap. Nobody's saying history didn't happen. And that's what the, their issue is. They're like, you're negating history. I understand things happened 100 years ago and 60 years ago or what have you. But I think it's a slap in the face to my ancestors and to civil rights leaders for me to not be able to know how to read. I don't understand how they fought for us to be able to go to school and then we got kids going to school and don't even know how to say their name anymore. It's absolute nonsense. But that's fault of ours. I keep saying that it's our fault and it's not white people's fault. I think us as black men in our communities are responsible right now for how, the way our communities have gone. I don't blame the women because women naturally, by order of God, follow the way the man goes. So I'm like, if, if we are, if you see an area of saturated with bad women, then you have an area saturated with bad men because women are only going to act like the men or try and get the men that's around them. So we want to saturate the area with good men and then we'll get good quality women out of that and then we'll get good quality children. But until we fix ourselves and take responsibility for some children, because I do believe every man should be responsible for at least one child that's not his, our communities would be in an entirely different space. Um, but I don't know what I said was wrong. They said this this rhetoric is harmful, uh, harmful to the reparations movement. It's harmful to black people because I'm trying to uplift us. I didn't say nothing bad. I said we should try and go do these things ourselves. Like, why not get up and let's go try and make something happen? It's not bootstrapping when it's 150 of us trying to do it. If it's one of us, sure, you can call it bootstrapping, but I did it. But if 100 of us get together and go do something, that's not bootstrapping. But they love saying that little bootstrapping crap and all these other excuses they keep giving as to why our communities are, you know, in better condition. We can do that. Well, we know that black people have it a little harder. OK, cool. Let's say that's true. Well, if I know my step has to be bigger to get off the step, then let's prepare to take a bigger step. I'm not about to not do anything. We got all these scared to death guys out here with no balls. And up here, scared of the white man. It's insane. They talk all this trash, but they scared. You're scared of the government. You're scared of the white man. Just say that. It's <laughs> your point about Booker T is so strong because we sit around and talk about what happened to them a mm -hmm. hundred years ago is why I can't do for myself and must have reparations. Booker T achieved more, Frederick Douglass achieved more while stuff was happening to them. Yep. While we sit around and talk about, well, what happened to them a long time ago, that's my excuse. And then and then we're supposed I'm supposed to believe that some white man that has a negative opinion of me 
that somehow prevents me from achieving. If, if, if Frederick Douglass and all the former slaves, if, if it was just like, you know what, white people had the opinion that y'all should be slaves. They would have been, okay, that's fine, you got that opinion, but it's not law, that's not what, I'm not a slave, it's not happening to me. No, opinions, people's ignorant opinions are irrelevant and useless. It, it blows my mind every time I talk to you, Randall, it's just, I, and I've asked the question before, but I just gotta ask you, you're 23, why do you think like this? Who taught you to think like this? It's, it's awesome. But I'm just saying, why, why, why do you think like this, and why do you have the balls to say it? I got granddaddies, man. Granddaddies, uncles, and, and men that helped raise me, including my grandmother and my mom. I had a full family. You know, and that's what some a lot of our kids are missing nowadays. Um, but I had a full family. I give credit to them for who I am and what I know, and I give credit to God for a lot of the things he's been able to show me that, you know, weren't taught. Uh, by the family. But a lot of this just come, you know, with learning and experience who I was at 19 when I first started the program and who I am now two completely different men. You know, even though the idea and objective is still the same, I've grown a lot and learned a lot of different things, you know, about parenting and, and about students and reading and children. It's, it's all been a journey, but um, I just take my mistakes and try and learn from them. Um, so I made a lot of mistakes and done a lot of things. But, you know, all that Wisdom comes from just working. And I've, I've lived a, a lot of life at 23. I'll say that I've done a lot of things. I've been to the military. I've done I've done a lot um, to, to be my age. Um, so I, I think God has allowed me to have so many positive and negative experiences to be able to teach uh, the, a lot of the young men that I have uh, in the program. You know, and I feel like I should be able to say these things. The only issue tr people truly have with me is that they want my mouthpiece. The reparations movement want me to speak for them. And then the FBA people want me to speak for them. And the Republicans want me to say something for them. And, and all these groups want me to say something for them. But my rhetoric is going to stay the same. I left uh, all black conference saying the same thing. Then I went to go speak at another conference with white people saying the same thing. My rhetoric is not going to change. Um, and that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a universal rhetoric. Um, even Fred Hampton, he was 21 when he got killed. Why did he get killed? Because he was linking all peoples together, black, white, Hispanic, everybody to go and attack the government and do what they're supposed to be doing. So as soon as he decided, or even Malcolm, as soon as Malcolm decided he wanted to get everybody together, then that's when he got to go. When Martin trying to get everybody together, that's when he got to go. It's like as soon as you start rallying everybody around one cause instead of fighting with the race card and fighting with this, once they understood we all have the same enemy, then that's when they had to go. Um, so, And that's what I've understood. We all got the same enemy. I'll go talk to whoever. I'll go talk to the Nation of Islam. I'll go talk to CPAC. I'm going to go talk to everybody because we all have the same common enemy. And that's and that's the big man <laughs> at the top. And, and that's what I want um, us to see. And we're going to keep fighting for what we want in our communities. If we truly want something, go get it yourself. Um, that's what I believe in. And I believe in truly going to get it. White, black, Hispanic. And that's why we have so much support. Everybody wants my mouthpiece. You can't have it. I'm going to tell the truth. And if people agree, then that's I don't care. Like they get mad. Oh, well, white people are under here agreeing with you. I don't care. White people are going to try to spin your message. Everybody's going to try to spin your message. You guys might try to spin it how you want to spin it. Regardless, I'm going to tell what I believe is the truth. And however, whoever wants to spin it, I don't have time to try and coddle people's feelings and try to make it where somebody can't spin it. They'll, if I say the sky is blue, somebody's going to say King Randall has proposed to blow up the sky with blue colors. Like, I mean, it, whatever. Like, that's what that, that's what happens. You know, so I'm going to say my truth, regardless of who agrees, who disagrees and who doesn't like it. I'm going to say the same thing on every platform in front of every different color person. That's their problem with me. They all want my mouthpiece. You can't have it. It's mine. I'm going to challenge, you know, there's a couple things you said that I disagree with. It's sure. somewhat irrelevant. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're young. And what I would challenge you on, like, particularly as it relates to Fred Hampton, do some more research. It, it, it's, it's Fred Hampton's being put out here and spun out here as some sort of hero. You are not Fred Hampton. You and Fred Hampton <laughs> no. have nothing in common. No, he's a communist, Marxist. Uh, who's, who he and his organization had killed several police officers. He, he got unfairly murdered in, an, in a, probably an illegal way. But when your organization and you have like five dead cop bodies on your resume, they're going to come get you at some point, come hell or high oh, yeah. water. They're going to figure out a way to come get you, and that's why they got him. 
the Black Panther Party again. I just you're young. I don't want I don't want to argue with you. I just want you to go look for yourself. Black Panther Party down with the LGBTQ movement. Communist, host, atheist. Uh, and when I say down with the LGBT community, I ain't just talking about support. I'm talking now, about participating. I know what we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, and when I, pimping out women, their women, you know, drug, dealing drugs. There's this little romanticized deal they got going on because they want you to think that these communists and people that was hostile to God, they were the good guys. But I, I again, you're on something completely different. Uh, and, and I'm so uh, pleased and just happy to see a young person like yourself with your energy and with just your fight and willingness not to back down. Uh, you keep searching for truth and you'll figure it all out. One day you'll be 55, 56 years old like me and, and there'll be some 23 year old that's on the right path and you'll just pat him on the back and say, how can I help? And, and you're, already, look, you're already doing it at 23. You're doing it with 14 and 15. Man, what you're doing is amazing. And, and I appreciate it. Don't let them shut you up. Uh, repar- you, you, you cut a check. It's like, oh, if we get money, the violence will stop. Money don't stop the violence. Only no. a heart change. Only a spiritual change. O- only a mental change. A, a, a worldview change will stop the violence and the, the, the random violence and all the disrespect in our community. Mm-hmm. You know, they can rain all the money they da- want on you. They, they don't rain money on how many rappers that O.J. Simpson had plenty of money. Yep. He still took he still took two bodies with him. Uh, so it ain't yeah, the money a, a lot of people, that, that does it. It's a hard change. It's a, it's a mindset change that has to happen, especially with our kids. And that's something money's not going to fix. Man, I'm like people are out here regardless of what's happening with the white man or whatever, still out here making bad decisions and bad choices and just being bad people. That doesn't have anything to do with poverty. It doesn't have to do anything with the the money they're t- trying to make. Because yeah, that could be good people, you know, mentally or morally that may have to go do whatever to make whatever. But I'm talking about people who truly have bad intentions, who are truly bad people, who are truly trying to hurt people and things like that. I'm not talking about your kid going to go take some snack cakes or some food from the grocery store. I'm talking about people who are trying to go stab and, and murder and kill. That has nothing to do with survival at all. Killing people has nothing to do with because they're always talking about survival and poverty. Yeah, I know people out there trying to survive, but these people, other people out here being completely evil and trying to ki- ki- hurt people and trying to kill people and trying to be evil. Like, that, that has nothing to do with survival. That's just being terrible. It's been a terrible person. That has nothing to do with the white man. You're just being a terrible person. Uh, we have to get a mindset change and, and bring our fathers back in particular. Um, and, you know, we'd be in a better place. I, I mean, I can give a brief example of my son um, right now. He's my oldest son. He's four. Um, and, you know, his mom was having a little he, he goes to my school, but he mostly will go stay with his mom um, after school or whatever. And she was like, I'm having a few discipline issues with him. And his teacher was just like he kind of talking back a little bit. So I took him for two weeks and now he's back where he should be like literally i'm just like hey i'm gonna get him for two weeks and he's gonna be back together real fast and this is because i just set rules set routines or whatever and he listens and that's what's supposed to happen um and that's that could happen across our communities easily with some type of male influence and i always say again every man should be responsible for at least one child that's not his and our communities will be in a better place how can people support you is there a website they can uh, visit and perhaps donate Yep. Our website is the X for boys dot org. That's T-H-E-X-F-O-R-B-O-Y-S dot org. You can go there uh, to see all of our photos, videos, uh, many things that we've done with the students. You can go there to see how to donate. And it's also not just monetary donations. You could donate to our Amazon wish list, um, donate supplies, our addresses there, anything you guys would like to donate or even just support. Or you can sign up for our email list to get email blasts from us to see what's happening uh, with the Life Preparatory School for Boys. Um, but it's the X for boys dot org. Thank you, Randall. Have a great weekend. All right, that was King Randall. Uh, you can email us at uh, let us to let us know your feedback at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. When we come back, Rice and Gray is going to be in studio with us. Shamika Michelle is going to join us via Skype. We're going to talk some more about the Black Panthers because <laughs> this whole Tupac video is... It's a celebration of the Black Panther Party, but we'll get into all that. It's my obligation, hate, discrimination.
All right, welcome back. As I told you, I had uh, Shamika Michelle and Bryson Gray watch the uh, Tupac documentary. I think it's on FX or Hulu or something I'm, I'm watching it on. Comes out, it's five parts. It's every Friday. There are two uh, episodes in. Each episode's about an hour long. The, the, the first episode starts out with, I thought, a preposterous story about Tupac uh, killing a white man in the streets or shooting at, they insinuate he killed a white guy in the streets, some stranger that uh, allegedly had just beaten up a black man and Tupac didn't know the dude, but jumped out of the car to confront the white guy because Tupac is so committed to defending black people and the story's being told by Tupac's cousin, who looked like a drug addict, certainly admitted criminal. It all just seemed far-fetched and preposterous. And, and the whole documentary, two episodes in, comes across more as a celebration and a reimagining of the Black Panther Party and re a reimagining of Tupac's relationship with his mother and a celebration of his mother. It's a celebration of his mother and the Black Panther Party, and it is totally removed, I think, from any truth. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting, but I just, I don't think it's remotely factual. It's hard for me to believe virtually any of it. it it's most of the people they're talking to are recovering drug addicts who were Black Panther Party members. It, it just, the selling of a false god to young people, particularly young black people, that's what the whole thing feels like. His mother's a mother god and Tupac's uh, white liberal America's favorite type of black man, dead for 25 plus years, love him, celebrate him. And so anyway, I'm old. That's why Bryson and Shamika are here to give me a more updated take on what I'm watching. Uh, we always uh, start ladies first. Shamika, two episodes in, your take on Dear Mama, uh, the celebration of Tupac's mama and the Black Panther Party. Well, Jason, I would tell y'all to cover your ears, but then you wouldn't know what I was gonna say. I just expect y'all to know me and be able to filter through it. First of all, let me say, when he started out, the cousin or whatever, saying that, oh, yeah, you know, Tupac was telling us to give him his uh, gun and none of us wanted to. So he ran around the car and he got it himself. As soon as I heard himself, I said, oh, he can't be trusted. So I was already not looking forward to it. But I will <laughs> say this documentary made me so sad, Jason. It was so disappointing because I think for 30 years, I've had this fantasy of Tupac and just imagining what he could be like, wishing that when he came to a and when I was in school with Digital Underground, wishing that I had been a groupie. You know, Bryson said earlier this week, when you see women that, you know, go after drug dealers, a lot of times it's because it's their nature, because they feel like they can provide for them or protect them. When I see like a thug kind of guy like Tupac was, there's this fantasy that in the bedroom, they going to put it down. And after <laughs> seeing this documentary, I felt as disappointed as I did when I rolled up on R. Kelly's sex tape. His, it was so disappointing. Like it just changed my whole view, just like it changed my whole view of R. Kelly. After seeing that sex tape, it was kind of like, one, we'll go to my room of fun. Two, is this it? Are you done? Like it's, I, I don't see Tupac in the same light anymore. And they talked about how his hair was even conscious. There was nothing conscious about his hair. It looked like an S curl that didn't 
uh, curl quite right, like Cedric the Entertainer said. And I would say, Jason, if he grew up in the time, like right now, we would be referring to him as Tupac because he was just very feminine. It's almost like California made him into a man, maybe, or the rap game made him more thug than he really was. He was a mama's boy. Everything about this, the way he esteems his mom, even in her failures, he was a complete mama's boy, and he would definitely be a part of BLM now, out marching in the streets, complaining, being oppressed, even when you're actually doing something successfully. Yeah, they could rename this Little Poc X. <laughs> so I got to be the person to disagree here. Oh, wow. And I know it's going to be shocking, but as a Tupac historian and as somebody that come from a family of Black Panthers, I do have to disagree. And the first reason why is because the story about him uh, suing the two guys, uh, in the documentary, they didn't tell the whole story, but he actually went to court for that. It is completely real, and it was two off-duty police officers. And he went to court for that, and he won the court case because they, they were actually harassing uh, somebody. Them being black or not really doesn't matter to me, but in, in, the, in, in this situation, it, it is black, and anybody can look up the, the, the court documents for that. So it's, Who was black? The cops? No, no, no. The cops were, the cops were white, but the people that the cops were... Uh, some stories that they were trying to rape him, but the, the, the court cases out there you can look up. And Pac did get down on one knee and <laughs> aim and shoot both. They didn't die. They're, they're, they're still alive to this day. Uh, I think to this day. I don't know. But that story really did. That story, that's a very true story. Uh, also, in, in, in the first. That's why we got you on. Love it. <laughs> also, like, I've seen, it was funny. I, I could have came here without even watching it because I. I've seen every Pac interview in existence that, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, so the, the first interview, it did, it did look sort of feminine. You know what I'm saying? But if you, if you watch that full interview, I feel like that was like that, that just the, the, the liberal art stuff coming out. Because watch the full interview, you'd be like, okay, it just must have been like the way he talked with his hands or whatever. But I, I don't think he's feminine at all. Now, Black Panthers are obviously a Marxist organization, um, definitely commies. But I do not think they would have been BLM. The difference between BLM and the Black Panthers is the Black Panthers, they didn't just talk. They had a free breakfast program. I know this to be true. And they didn't just serve black people. They served poor white people and everybody else in it. God, okay, but if, if free breakfast, that's your resume, that's what you go no. down in history for. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not done. I'm not done. Right. They also made kids work out. They made kids learn discipline. They they taught kids how to shoot. They taught kids how they, they taught black people how to be um, how to work for themselves. It wasn't no lazy uh, uh, thing teaching everybody how to be gay like what BLM does. And also, a lot of stuff did happen. My grandmother was almost raped by a cop. My grandmother was in a shootout with the police and everything. Uh, like anybody can look this up. My story is, my story is very public. Um, and my uncle, uh, my uncle Brad, he was actually one of the leaders of the Black Panther sect. And uh, they did get abused by police quite a bit. But it wasn't just them. KKK, too. So, hold on. The KKK got abused by police. Is yeah, what? The, same, the same people that shut down the Black Panther shut down the KKK. Right. And so, take the Fred Hampton story. That, that's one I've done a lot of research mm -hmm. on. I don't know about that one specifically. Okay, Fred Hampton up in Chicago. And they told that story in the documentary, mm -hmm. did some light work on it. But, but here's the reality. At the time Fred Hampton was murdered, I don't have the exact numbers, but he and or his group had been involved in two or three previous other shootouts with Chicago police. And the body count was like five police officers dead, eight police officers wounded. And on the Black Panther side, I think it was one Panther dead, three or four wounded. Mm -hmm. And so I listened to black dudes, yeah, the Black Panther, I was like, well, hold on, when the body count is five dead on one side and one dead on the other side, you think the other side, whether they're police or not, they're gonna get some get back. That's the law of the streets. And so, so, okay, some stuff I can't say. I can actually hook you up with some, some Black Panthers to get on here, because some stuff I don't think they, you know, I talked to the other day that some things don't want me to say. But um, you got to think about why they even got into these shootouts in the first place. Why, do you, why did they say? 
Well, I mean, it, it's from both sides. So they pretty much put trumped up charges on the Black Panthers as an organization. And then they went to go, they went to go get them. And this wasn't no regular stuff. They really did beat them up and not, and not like literally stop them from taking mud shots until two weeks later when they face healed. Like that stuff is true. Now, but don't get it confused. This entire documentary is to make people, like younger black people think you're going through what your, what your grandparents went through when no, we're not. We don't go through that. Not saying nobody, nobody, but I'm back to blue. You know what I'm saying? So we're not oppressed. We, we don't get hunted down by police. But at some point in time, these things did happen. Like the, like the situation with uh, cop, um, where the cop pit, pit Tupac on the ground and his face was jacked up. That really did happen. This wasn't no, it wasn't a I joke. I believe that happened. Yeah. But I also believe given Tupac's behavior, he was giving the police the business. Of course he probably was. Time. He probably was talking junk to him, calling them all types of names. Yes. And yeah. so, again, I don't bend over backwards with sympathy when someone, you know, oh, you got bit by a dog? Oh, and you were fussing with the dog? You, you saw him barking, yeah. but you went up and stuck your hand in the fence anyway? You, you. But logically, we got to do that the other way, right? Because I'm, a, I, I, I'm the person that say uh, a black person shouldn't beat up a white person if they say the N-word. Right. But it, it's just a word. So all Tupac did was yell words at him. And it probably was disrespectful. But it, it got to go. If, if the logic go one way, the logic has to go the other way. That means you also got to say if a white person call a black person the N word, knowing you're trying to piss them off and you get beat up, you deserved it at that point. If that's the logic we're going to go to. There is part of my logic of of like yeah, you, you say triggering words. I, I'm not going to cry. Yeah, yeah. A bunch of tears for you. I don't don't tell me the sob story. And and now, do I think am I easily triggered? No. Uh, but but it's fat. I'm I'm glad you're here. I'm gonna circle back, but I, I want Shamika. I want you to respond to any of that or any, or it, you know, Bryson is caping up for the Black Panthers, which I'm, <laughs> I'm glad he is. That is, <laughs> it's true. I'm glad he is. Maybe, you know, I'm willing to be proven wrong or, or shot down here. Your thoughts on Bryson caping up for the Black Panther Party? <laughs> well, I do appreciate the, the women and children's program that they had. I have heard about that. And I do know that Tupac shot some undercover cops. My thing was, I don't think he was as gangster as... I initially thought he was. After seeing this documentary, I do feel like Bryson's gaydar might not, I ain't gonna say he's gay. Let me say his feminine uh, radar might need to be tweaked a little bit, but he's a man. He's not going to look at it the same way. And so for me, I did see a different Tupac than I thought you know, was. And it was just very disappointing for me. I feel like he uh, was a mama's boy. I feel like this documentary is to uplift his mom and just kind of make her be this uh, hero or this queen. And I didn't like that. I But I've said before on the show, I don't like the line that he said, um, you know, even though you were a, a crack fiend, you always was a black queen. I don't like that. I've seen so many men that have been raised or not raised, but in the home with crackhead moms that just didn't turn out right. And lot, their lives were really, really bad. So this idea that black men should just always esteem their mothers and never be able to speak out about their failures is just a personal pet peeve of mine that I just don't like. And so when I see documentaries such as this or shows that kind of always make the black woman look like she's never wrong. I just have a personal issue with that because I know too many men who have experienced being in the home with wrong mothers and the toxicity that comes along with that. So that's my take on the show. The toxicity and, course, and the femininity that comes yes. along with that. They mentioned that she raised him up around the whole LGBTQ crowd. Brian, here's what I want your reaction to. I, I said this to Shamika earlier right. this week. Uh, Eminem mm -hmm. writes music, 
trashing his drug abusing tra trashy mama. Mm -hmm. Tupac celebrates his mama. And so it to me it's, it speaks to like white people have expectations for their mamas. And Eminem is mad that his mama wasn't right. Mm. As black people, we said, well, at least she was there when she wasn't on drugs or when she got out of rehab or when she wasn't uh, running off doing uh, uh, Black Panther party business. She paid attention to me. To, to th this, And again, I, I don't want to offend your friends, but I just feel like we're telling a very glorified story of the Black Panther Party. I agree. They pimped out their women. Many of them were hoes. Sometimes, and, yeah. And pimps. That's never talked about. The, many of the, the daddies, again, Tupac's father, who even really knows who he is? Yeah, he don't sure. even really know. Yeah, who, who he is. And it's because, his, trust me, his mama was getting pimped out. Oh, so here go the thing. My issue with this documentary is I do feel like they praised the Black Panther. It almost felt to me they're trying to inspire a new version of it. Yes. And it felt to me like they were trying to prop a woman up as if she, you know what I'm saying? So I was, I'm not caving for the Black Panthers, but I'm saying there is a lot of truth. Sometimes lies starts with truths. Black people were oppressed in this country before. Black people were mistreated in this country before. We just don't go through it. But that, that one truth can lead to everybody thinking they go through it. Um, but the, 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 the thing about it, though, is Eminem did talk bad about his mom, but he also talked about killing her and raping her, too. Yeah, I know. He, <laughs> he went too far with it. But, yeah, yeah. but again... So both, both sides are crazy to me. They are crazy, yeah. but I can understand... Em My mama was trifling and abandoned me and didn't take care of me. I can understand that anger as opposed to... My mama was a drug queen or a crack drug queen, queen crack mama, queen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you always was a black queen yeah, she, mama. She's she's doing anything and everything for the Black Panther Party. She was pregnant with me while in prison yep. because she's messed. She put a poison in her son, and then she's and again mindset and and again where you're at during your pregnancy, being in prison, and and she's sitting there saying, "Yeah, my mama taught me how to survive in this white world." The boy's dead at 25. 25. Did she? Maybe she should have prepared him for this black world, and he would still be alive. I, I, I think. Um, I think people underestimate the effect of growing up with a single mother. And, I, and, I, and Tupac said something I couldn't stand. He said, "My mother was my mother and my father." And it's like that's mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I do agree there's issues with this documentary, but a lot of it was factual just from an objective point of view. That's my that's my only issue. I don't I, I'm not a cape for the Black Panthers. You know what I'm saying? Because that 10 point plan is very like if, you, if you, they're against capitalism. If, if, if you research the history on it, um, you know, what I'm saying they, they will probably seal with sodomizing dudes for discipline. Now that's mm. how now I, I, I that's a fact. About that. I mean, that's probably true. I'm just saying I don't that's know about that. That's a fact. You gotta know about that. But if you talk to most, like if you talk to most of the Black Panthers that, that are leaders now, they're all against LGBT. Matter of fact, Tupac, Tupac. Uh, Unless they go to prison. Well, possibly. But, <laughs> but, 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 but even Tupac, if you talk to anybody that knew Tupac, they were they felt disrespected because some gay dude did a did a allude to Tupac and everybody knew Tupac was super against the LGBT. So that's why I said that when Shamika said my gator might be off, but it's, it's not because of that. It's because I'm really a Tupac historian, and uh, he uh, he definitely wasn't with the LGBT stuff at all. Okay, but this portrayal again, like the opening of that deal was like Tupac was going to protect black people no matter what. That's that's what the cousin said. Yeah. I'm like, huh. So why was he beating up the dude at the MGM, in the lobby of the MGM That's right before? a different black person. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, well, why was he accused of raping some black girl at a club? That was untrue, though. Yeah. He did three years. Yeah, but uh, his semen was not found on the scene at all. Zilch. Nada. His semen was not found. Multiple dudes' semen was found in here, but not. Why was he on record threatening to kill Biggie and Puffy every five minutes? But he just loved black folks. Because he's a degenerate. Yeah. yeah. So, don't, don't sell me on this myth that Tupac, every, oh, everything, everything he did was for black people and for the upliftment. And then the, the other thing that I just found comical was, oh, if he didn't get a record deal, he was going to be the leader of the new Black Panther Party. That's probably true. Historically. Listen, everything has to have nuance. Just because the, the documentary has a clear-cut agenda to it don't mean something's in it isn't true. 
But <laughs> hold on. Rapper or revolutionary? Well, if I don't get this record deal, I'm going to be a revolutionary. Yeah. That's like me saying, well, if this DoorDash don't come, mm -hmm. I'm going to be a vegetarian. Well, okay. <laughs> his, in, his, in his mind, he thought the best way to be a revolutionary was through music, which is, which is, which is what he said. And by the way, it is verified he was working trying to restart the new Black Panther Party. That's, that's a factual thing he tried to do. All I'm saying is some things, we, we can call out the I'll agenda. I'll make him hit him up. If I make it, he gonna be the new. I'm not saying he's not a hypocrite. I'm just, I'm just saying <laughs> we got to talk about the nuance. Even though the agenda was there, we got to talk about the facts also. <laughs> Shamika, we got a, we got a uh, Tupac caper over here. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Tupac is story is just another way of saying. A cape. You know, Go ahead. for this documentary, I probably would have caped up for him too. I'm telling you, I am sitting in the seat of disappointment right now. The same seat that I sat in with R. Kelly and as a woman who had these ideas about certain men, it's not a good seat to sit in. So you all should just be happy that you're going back and forth with what you're disagreeing about and that you don't have to suffer this disappointment that I'm suffering <laughs> after seeing the real uh, Tupac. You know, I just, I wasn't happy about this documentary at all. There you go, Bryson. I mean, he was a simp. He was a, he was writing poems before rapping. He he was definitely a simp. You heard him. He said uh he switched up because he he, he thought being being too nice didn't work for him. So he was a yeah. simp. So I, I'm not a Tupac caper. I'm yeah, just a factual person. Like just because something is generally wrong, I'm not gonna deny the facts within it though. Got you. So they want to make Tupac a hero. Mm -hmm. He's dead at 25. Mm -hmm. They want to make his mama a hero. She was locked up and a drug fiend. For a, a great deal of her life. And they want to make the Black Panther Party a hero because they gave away free breakfasts. Ah, oh, come on. I said, so listen. What's on their, what's on their win, what's in their win column? I mean, even Shavika named some good things they said. So overall. So said, what did they do? What, what is their what accomplishment? They, they had multiple programs. They taught black kids discipline. They actually had programs for black kids to make sure they learn how to shoot guns, learn how to read books. This, this is something that they were very prominent for. Once again, I'm not capable for them. Black, generally speaking, Black Panthers was bad overall. But if you compare them to BLM, at least in their mind, they were actually trying to make black people smarter uh teach about people they had them doing push-ups making sure they was fit they had them that, that they again, pimping women they, they had they had ambulances did, did you know the black panthers had actual ambulances where like it was a free ambulance and they went they literally had the thing where they went to go pick people up that was hurt once again generally bad but you can't deny these things don't when you want black people to read more yes and if 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 i thought that the free breakfasts and the ambulances and the reading were the primary things they were involved in. I mean, everything was pro-black, obviously, and Marxism. I don't think that's pro-black. Marxism is not pro-black. In their mind. I'm talking about what no, they in their mind. Yeah, and so much of the stuff in their mind was BS, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Marxist, hostile to God. Go. Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, you can go read their speeches promoting the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. You can go read their actual speeches. And so they were BLM before BLM. I don't know what these other guys now running away from it, recreating history. No, this, 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 was, this was the original times. Okay, but, but yeah. I'm saying they're, they're recasting. Bobby Seale, there are actual speeches. You can hear it come out of their own mouth. The whole matriarchy agenda, the whole LGBTQ agenda, and there again, anytime your leadership comes from prison, uh -huh. there's going to be some sexual deviance with that <laughs> leadership. I'm just telling you. They, they, everybody comes out of prison talking tough. Many of them switch hitters. Yeah, but see, uh, once again, what I'm saying is, you're talking about the, the two leaders. There was internal disagreements. I can bring three people that were leaders in Black Panthers on this show, and they will tell you Black Panthers, from at least in North Carolina, never agreed or pushed that agenda. So, and once again, I'm not saying that their agenda was good. I'm just saying some of the things they did, if Black Lives Matter would do it, then I think Black Lives Matter would be a little bit better than what they are now. Because they don't teach men to be men. They don't, they don't teach uh, men to be fit, to learn how to read. They teach you how to 
nothing. I mean, just to be gay, generally speaking, and be soft. Be left. And not like they don't even like guns in BLM. They was pro Second Amendment, Black Panthers. All right, we beat up Tupac. Oh, oh, <laughs> the other, you know, the, I, I almost forgot. There was the other thing I wanted to uh, bring up. Lizzo was in Tennessee recently, <laughs> and uh, what? she gave a speech promoting drag queens. Uh, let's watch the speech. I was told by people on the internet, cancel your shows in Tennessee, don't go to Tennessee. And uh, you don't have to do that person. They, their reason was valid. But why would I not come to the people who need to hear this message the most? Lizzo, uh, is, is, first, is, is Shamika and Bryson, is, is Lizzo that talented? Is she, th is she that amazing of a, performance, a performer? I think she's a great, what, did, what do they call it, a flautist, a, a flute, a flautist or whatever Flutist. they call it. She plays the flute very, very well. I don't think that she can sing that great. She can't dance that great. She is fat and can get around really good. So I think people applaud her fatness because it's like, wow, we've never seen a big giant lump of lard move around so well and so people nowadays because they want to just applaud everything that's actually beneath what we used to hold as standards they give her a pass she's not this great singer but i do like the fact that she is a black flute player and she seems to play it really really well i played the flute coming up and i could never play on the level that lizzo plays and i wish that she stuck to that because you don't see a lot of kids nowadays playing instruments. And so I like that idea. But all of this other stuff that she is pushing, the being heavy set and overweight as if it's healthy, the, you know, just going out looking any kind of way as if that's the standard for women. I think all of that is wrong. And it bothers me that we are putting these women in these positions to actually speak to foolishness. Uh, of course, Lizzo is a woman. She's going to be empathetic and she's a fat woman. So she's going to be even more empathetic because she understands what it feels like to be ostracized. I'm not surprised at her speaking to the, the transgenders or the drag queens because she actually had a transgender on her show. Uh, watch out for the big girls where I feel like this man who was less than talented actually took a spot from some well-deserving woman, but that she put him in there because she, he was transgender. Um, you know, it just, all of this is silly, Jason, because to me, people don't have an issue with drag queens. People have an issue with drag queens performing in front of children. And I don't know why this is so hard for people to understand. We have talked about the fact that I used to, to strip or dance in my early years. I was an adult. I could do what I wanted to do. But what I truly believe in my heart is if I ever stepped into a kindergarten room trying to take my show on the road, people would have had a problem with that as they should. The fact that now we feel like we can do these adult entertainments 
uh, events in front of kids just shows how far gone we are as America. No one cares if a man decides to dress like a woman. Long as he ain't my man, do what you want to do. The problem is when you start going and, and being in classrooms and pushing this on children and making kids confused and think, oh, this is what I can be when I grow up or this is something that I want to do now. They have shows where little boys Young boys are dancing around in front of grown men and grown men are throwing them money. This is pedophilia. And the fact that you have people like Lizzo supporting this just shows where we are. And it's crazy to me. No way would I have ever sat in a classroom in second, third grade and some male teacher or even female teacher would have been able to say to me, Shamika, do you like men or women? My family would have gone down to that school and torn the school to pieces because it would have been seen as grooming. It would have been seen as if they were trying to, to lead me a certain direction. Now that's what school is about. Now that's acceptable. And and I'm trying to figure out what's what's wrong with people. Y'all are nuts. You, you're nuts and you got nuts. And you're letting nuts swing all over the place just because. First off, Lizzo music sucks. Okay? I personally think it sucks very, very bad from an artistic perspective. But <clears throat> I'm going to disagree with Shamika on something. And this is a message for any conservative listening, right? I do care about people, dress, grown men dressing up as women. Matter of fact, I think it should be outlawed, straight out illegal. But everybody agrees. Everybody truly agrees, though. When people say, I only care, I, I don't care what adults do, just kids, that is not true. Because the kids that's at these drag shows, they are taken there by their adult parents. That's their kids, right? Why can't they take their own kids? If they want to take their own kids to these drag shows, why not? It's their, it's their children. This is what the adults decided to do with the kids with their own seed. But you're against it because deep down we know this is disgusting and wrong. Drag shows shouldn't exist, period. Lizzo is a grown adult. Everybody that was on stage with her was grown adults. Why are we even complaining? All she's doing is advocating for what she wants to advocate for. Why are we even complaining? What's so bad about what she said? What's bad about what she says, we know that this is immoral. These are adults pushing it. The only reason the kids get to the kids is through the adults. So I don't even think we should be allowing adults to do it, which is why I sort of agree with my man that was on here talking about Christian nationalism. Because I, in Uganda, you think they let some adults be, do whatever they want? No. Locked up. Jailed. Ten years. <laughs> I'm going to just stop there. That's, that's it. Well... <laughs> We're going to stop there. <laughs> Great job. Thank you both. Uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back. As promised, Pastor Michael Smith is going to join us. He's a pastor at the Church of Jacksonville, I believe. Uh, I saw a TED talk he gave, I believe in 2015, white minister talking about black murder and talking about rap music and how we've normalized it. Let's watch a clip, an excerpt from this TED talk. It's amazing. Chicago, just like New Orleans, just like Jacksonville, just like Little Rock, how common is black murder? The past three years, there's been about 1,270 uh, victims of homicide, 2012, all the way up to this week uh, in 2014. And of those victims, 64 were white. Now, this transcends the simple diagnosis that we have. Well, it's education, it's poverty, it's family structure. As you study it locally, nationally, as you study it decade after decade, it doesn't follow any of those easy answers. Something much deeper and much darker is at work. How common is black murder? Well, in my entire life, 1973 to 2014, there has never been a year since I've been breathing that blacks have not been overrepresented in homicide. 
Never been a year that you can go into a morgue and you don't see blacks overrepresented. It's the story of America. It's certainly the story of America in my lifetime. My question is, what will be the first year that we see it a one-to-one -one ratio? I mean, if it's somewhere between seven to one and 10 to one now, I mean, when will it be one to one? We would consider it a huge national victory if we ever got it to five to one, to four to one, to three to one. Violent crime has gone down over the past 40 years. People say, isn't that great? No, because prison has gone up over the past 40 years. And no matter the fact that violent crime has gone down or prison has gone up, what's never closed is the gap. There's always that gap, six to one, seven to one, eight to one. Usually it's the smartest person in the room at this point that yells out from the back, sir, are you saying you want more white people killed? And then all of a sudden I realize that's why we die in clumsy accidents. All right, here we go. <laughs> <clears throat> Michael Smith, uh, welcome to the show. I'm sorry I'm so late. Uh, to finding out about you, but when I saw the TED Talk, I was like, man, I want to talk to this dude. This white dude gets up and talks about black murder, talks about rap music. Who is this guy? Who, who are you? Where'd you, get, where'd you get that set? We need more, we need more like you. Uh, well, first of all, Jason, thank you for having me on. I, uh, I look back at that talk, and uh, it was such an intense time. I'm looking at the video. I'm also uh, I'm not quite the same man. I'm, I'm 60 pounds plus, I think, the man that I was in that video. But um, that is, uh, that's me, kind of, that's, that comes out of my story. I was uh, raised in Central Florida, kind of in this all-white, um, you know, uh, echo chamber of, you know, very few uh, interactions with anybody who was non-white. And uh, kind of my background is I had a religious experience when I was 15, um, very dramatic for a young teenager and relocated. I left high school and moved to the south side of Atlanta to an all black congregation and uh, uh, went to Bible school and became a youth pastor and associate pastor uh, and uh, of a congregation, about 20,000 people uh, at the time that I left. And it marked me uh, being in where I was the exact opposite, where I was the only white guy, you know, down to one or two percent. And uh, it stayed with me. And as I grew up and began to see some of the things going on and moved to Jacksonville and a lot of the uh, pain that I was seeing among uh, certain uh, elements or certain segments of the community, um, the TED Talk kind of came out of my observations um, through, that, through that journey. So in Atlanta, a music city, yeah. a rap music city, that's probably where a lot of your insight into hip hop and just the role it plays in normalizing black death? Yeah, I like most white kids, you know, I was, um, you know, you grew up with Rapper's Delight. I was born in 73, I guess, as you saw in the video, and then kind of got into, I guess it was uh, the Fat Boys, and, and then, uh, of course, Run DMC and the Aerosmith crossover leading into uh, the Beastie Boys, which is kind of for a lot of white suburban kids, their introduction into um, not only rap as kind of something that we could uh, see ourselves in, but also kind of the introduction of the of the borrowing from the culture idea of black criminality and merging that with white suburban uh, youth rebellion. And so that kind of was my introduction all the way up. And I mean, you know, Just Ice and Scott LaRock and Ice T and, uh, you know, all those, you know, all those folks were, you know, a long time ago, a long time ago to me is mid to late eighties, you know, late eighties and then into NWA. And, and uh, that was my journey. And then as I went on, of course, it, uh, my, my knowledge got, um, more broad, my, my appreciation for the art form got more broad, but so did my ears to kind of hear the, uh, the sickness uh, that is uh, endemic in a lot of it. Why don't more ministers talk about it? It's something I'm passionate about in turn, because I love music. And, and right. music is a form of communication that I think is far more powerful than many people understand or have had explained to them. You can hear a song and you can almost remember the day you heard it. You can remember what, oh, I was in sixth grade and I liked this girl and I can remember riding the car and blah, blah. Music is the only thing that I know that has that kind of connection with you. And, and I don't, you know, there was a time when C. Dolores Tucker and the, 80s, 90s, or whatever, people were speaking out about hip hop, but but now it, it seems untouchable. And 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 these guys that really I call them Hugh Hefner's basically. They're, they're lyrical pornographers, but but they're front and center. They're they're the leaders. They're the icons of the mainstream, and everybody just kind of accepts it. And I, and I've I've just wondered why 
ministers have been so silent on that issue? Well, I, I can't speak for everyone. I know there are a lot of black ministers that have been vocal about it. Um, and certainly there are no shortage of white ministers, white politicians, specifically back in the 80s, two live crew, Uncle Luke, and those kind of as nasty as they want to be in those different controversies. Uh, but I think a lot of it gets framed um, maybe from a non-compassionate engagement, like like you're speaking out against this because, and I, I, I don't agree with this, but uh, this is the perception, because it's a black art form, which of course uh, it certainly may, you know, there's arguments to be made about the origins of rock and jazz and folk and hip hop, um, uh, you know, uh, related to um, African Americans and 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 those other roots. But I don't know if content uh, has to be considered uniquely black. And and you know, if you just look at the journey, right? I mean, when NWA first came out, um, you know, talking about self destruction, they had the song "Dope Man," you know. Uh, hey, Mr. Dope Man, you think you're sick, you, you're slick, you sold crack to my sister, and now she's sick. If she happens to die because of your drugs, I'm going to, you know, I won't complete the lyric, but I'm going to kill you, basically. And it was kind of like, you know, we are um, pushing back against the toxicity in the in the community. But then it kind of morphed over time to um, let's celebrate the toxicity. And then it kind of morphed even more that the more authentic, the hyper-criminalized, hyper-sexualized persona of the artist uh, the the more it was able to be turned into massive revenue. And that, I think, is uh, the issue. And so a lot of white pastors, you know, a lot of black pastors, I think, maybe ministers and not just pastors, but imams and, you know, rabbis. and things. I think maybe some speak out of it and they're seen as old school or, you know, out of touch. This is no different than any of the music when your childhood. They hated you listening to Little Richard and you hate us listening to the celebration of black murder. And they're not even remotely the same. But I think for white people, when they speak it, if they don't have that connection, uh, to the demonstrated compassion that the issue uh, is the value of black life in their eyes, then it comes across as speaking out against uh, blacks and black art forms. So it's a very dicey thing. And, um, you know, I will stipulate that that there's a strong possibility that people create this music, people who create this music, I, I know this is not true, but I'll stipulate that they are raised in America's cultural sewers and nourished by its its cultural feces, and they have no knowledge that you just shouldn't celebrate denigration of women and things like that. We know that's not true, but let's just pretend that. But the people in the boardrooms, the A&R rooms, the content rooms, they didn't come from that, and they clearly know what's happening. Uh, and I think the music, I don't think it causes murder, although there could be an argument there. Like you say, the way it, the way it shapes mindset, we can't be dishonest that words and images don't affect the way people think. But it's not the causation of my issue is, it's kind of the acquiescence to the norm normalcy of it. Like this is, there's a large opinion among people in power that believe this is just normal for what black people do. We don't do it and we're not interested in it, but there's money to be made. And so why interrupt them from their authentic expression when it's a multi, multi-billion dollar opportunity for non-white or for non-black uh, uh, businesses and advertisers, et cetera. So it's a pretty sick and twisted uh, <laughs> uh, culmination or uh, amalgam of, of factors. The reason why their arguments don't hold up to me is because they know very well if a white rapper said many of the things that a black rapper said, they would be up mm -hmm. in arms and it would be stopped instantly. And so they know mm -hmm. the music matters and the words matter and that you're pouring poison into the hearts and minds of children. You know, kids are really influenced by this music. But, but I, I want to pivot because in doing a little research on you, I, I, I saw that uh, at least in 2000 or in a previous time, and I wonder if it's still true, your congregation was 50-50 or half black, half white, very diverse. How have you been able to pull that off? Uh, well, so I'm no longer pastoring. I've turned the church over to one of our elders, and they're running it now and doing a phenomenal job. But when we started it, it was black and white. Now, again, coming out of the church that I came out of, where I was an only white face amidst uh, 20,000 black faces, not the only, but very few, um, there was cr uh, credibility given to me as though, you know, um, I am seen as in, in some circles as somebody who's sympathetic, as an insider. And I was taken in that way as a little teenage kid, uh, as family. And so uh, that my my preaching, my approach, my worldview is very much shaped in um, I, I won't per se. I don't know anything about what it's like to be black. And I don't think the black experience is a monolithic experience to begin with. But I certainly when I speak, 
I don't speak in terms that uh, uh, a diverse audience can't relate to. So that's part of it. the other part of it is uh, it's a little easier for me uh, for a lot of reasons uh, as a white person to have a mixed congregation versus a black pastor simply because uh, people that come from where I come from were conditioned. We're not really conditioned to seeing black people in authority. We're not really conditioned to uh, black teachers or black sheriffs or black mayors or black. And so for black congregants to come in and bring their kids into a room where uh, the, the, the children's leader is black or the uh, is white or the youth pastor is white or even the senior pastor is white. That's an experience that many blacks in the South have had a long time, but not a lot of whites have. And so we tried to do an experiment here with, you know, could, could we bind over our commonality in Christ? Could we bind on an identity that's bigger than the racial construct without ignoring or denying uh, those long held histories? And uh, we used to call it heaven practice. Like we, we feel like when we get on the other side, we're going to look around. It's, it's going to look like that. And we tried to we tried to have a little bit of it uh, there. And of course, I will tell you this. But when I started dealing with something, things like this, there were congr- white congregants that left. I, we went from uh, my wife is here with me, but I, I think we went from about, I don't know how many, 4,200 uh, people at its heyday. And I think we had 600 white families leave when I started talking about these issues. So uh, there's definitely a cost if you don't stay inside the uh, inside the bubble. Talking about the normalization and the, the, how negative the normalization of black murder is ran off your white residents or white congregants? Yeah. Yeah, the the thing to me was it it got pushed back as, look, it's freedom of speech. Why would you against, be against freedom of speech? I actually had people write me and say, look, if if white people made music about killing each other, if gays made music about killing each other, if Jews made music about killing each other, the radio stations would play it. So so stop trying to make it like there's some deep, dark uh, um, uh, <laughs> racial history to this. Uh, it, it's about freedom of speech. Let them make what they want. Let advertisers do what they want. And my res- my response was simply if. You know, if and the fact that you cannot find widespread incidents of Jewish uh, creators celebrating their own destruction or, or, or LGBTQ creators celebrating their own destruction. But the fact that you can find massive multi-billion dollar corporations not only willing to fund the idea of the young black criminal, but willing to curate it, willing to say to artists, you know, we think you got something here. Could you thug it up a little? And that is the actual experience from artists. Many of them say, I, I came in uh, and you just look at it. I mean, just look at the last Super Bowl, right? Look at the, 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 the celebration of white supremacy at the last Super Bowl halftime show. Uh, it is people, whether they're the authentic gangster or not, it doesn't matter. It is people who have made their uh, multi-billion dollar empire on the perception and celebration of black criminality uh, and, and can come out not with any of their top songs that they can sing without editing lyrics about violence to other blacks. And set aside that you have Eminem, which fits into an old Ozzy Osbourne or an Alice Cooper or a, or a Marilyn Manson. He's the crazy suicidal white guy that parents don't want their kids listening to. But over here in this idea of this is the modern black hero, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a coup. I mean, the, the suggestion, which is as old as the post-Civil War, you better watch out for black people because, man, they're after your ladies, they're after your, your children, they're going to murder, they're going to kill. The fact that, you know, we actually got people to agree to sing that and to portray that and compensated them with 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 money to to perpetuate and celebrate and acquiesce to a white supremacist narrative. It's a it's it's got to be the greatest trick the devil ever pulled or one of the greatest tricks. Well, Michael, I really appreciate you taking the time. Wanted to hear your story. Your TED talk was amazing. Watched the whole thing. I think I watched it twice. Thank you so much. Have a great uh, weekend. Uh, You guys uh, watching on YouTube, make sure you're hitting that like button. If you're listening over Apple, make sure you're giving me that five-star review. Let's play some tomorrow.